how you don't want to do it. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for that kind introduction. <laughs> I'll start immediately because we're short in time already. Some of you, or perhaps most of you, might have heard of Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, the SETI project, where they are scanning the skies for radio signals that are supposed to come from alien civilizations. And I really sympathize with this project because, just think of it, they're not only looking for extraterrestrial life, but for intelligent life, and for intelligent life that had constructed civilizations, civilizations that have come up with a technology that uses radio waves and that are sending them right now so we can see them. I mean, it's a really tough job, uh, but someone's going to do it. And this is where I will disappoint you, because that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit more uh, moderate in my aspirations, so uh, this is what I do. Uh, looking for terrestrial intelligence, um, okay, we think we have found at least one species, Homo sapiens. Uh, that's at least how we define intelligence by us, ourselves. But as a matter of fact, why look for intelligence on Earth? Uh, Non-human as well as human. Well, one thing is, we don't even know what it is, actually. We don't know what thinking is. We have this big, fat blob in our head uh, doing fantastic stuff. But actually, we don't know how it works. So, uh, people like me in my field, comparative cognitive scientists, like to look at other species as well to look for intelligence. And these are some of our favorite species right now. Great apes, corvid birds, and dolphins. Uh, they attract our interest because they are similar to us in their thinking in technological terms or uh, causal cognition or social cognition, we can relate to them, so therefore we think they're intelligent. intelligent. Uh, and in our mind, the only way to figure out how thinking, this magical thing, works, is to compare. Is to compare earthly intelligences, like these guys. How did their mind work? And why? Why must we compare? I'll show you. Is there anyone who can see the red dot? No? Okay. It doesn't really matter. It's in the middle somewhere. It doesn't really matter because it's us. It's Homo sapiens. It represents our species. The rest of the 13,000 spots are uh, mammals and birds, contemporary species, those that live now, that exist now. Uh, What's interesting with this is that all of these species, they have a nervous system. They use thinking and cognition every day to survive, uh, just like we do. And another thing that is very important, that, uh, that is that we're all related to each other. The basic of our neural systems are the same. Uh, I could have added amphibians, fishes, reptiles, and so on, that also have uh, nervous systems, but they simply don't fit uh, in this picture. You wouldn't see it as dots. Um, so now, most of you might have figured out why we should compare. Well, because looking at one dot and thinking that we can find intelligence and how it works would be like uh, reading one word in a novel. It wouldn't make much sense. So I will show you how we do it just in principle before I'll go into the details. Uh, here you have a timeline and the tree that describes our relationships with our closest relatives, the great apes. Uh, closest living relatives, that is. Uh, you see that 14 million years ago, we shared a last common ancestor with the orangutans. Nine million years ago, with the gorillas. Six million years ago, with the chimpanzees and the bonobos, who li later diverged two million years ago. We know this. And you might think that these million years are a very long time, but actually it isn't. In the evolutionary uh, sense or in a geological context, it's not long at all. However, we have this information. So uh, the comparative cognitive scientist now takes a cognitive ability, like let's say one form of memory, tries it out in a human. How does it work in a human? Does he have that kind of memory? Yes. And what's the limitations and so on? And then go on and try the rest of the species, the chimps, the gorillas and orangutans. 
if we find it in the chimps, then we know it evolved at least six million years ago. If we find it in the gorilla, at least nine. And in the orangutan, at least 14. And if the orangutan doesn't have it, okay, after 14, for example. And if we find a unique ability in any of these apes, humans are apes, then we know it's unique for that lineage. This is how it works in practice, or, or in theory at least. In practice, it's a bit more uh, difficult. Uh, this is one way of working with comparing species. The other way uh, is exemplified by this one. You can't see the figures, I guess. It's our last common ancestor with the birds, 300 million years ago before the dinosaurs. Uh, still, if you take a crow bird and compare it to an ape or to a dolphin, and to dolphins, it was 90 million years ago we had a common ancestor, we find similarities high similarities in their intelligence, how they view others, how they understand their surroundings and so on, then we know this can't have come from our common ancestor. It has developed independently. And then we can look at the selective pressures. And then we can learn something about the principles of cognition. So this is another way of comparing. Now I'll cut to the core instead, now when you know how we work. I will give you an example of a particularly successful comparative cognitive study that I had the luck to be involved in, but why it, it had a real big impact. And why? Uh, ex I don't exactly know why, but first, I would like you to read this, or I can read it for you. Uh, this is a statement by Dan Gilbert. He's a professor of psychology. He made this at a TED Talk in 2004, and he said this, Human beings have this marvelous adaptation that they can actually have experiences in their heads before they try them out in real life. This is a trick that none of our ancestors could do, that no other animal can do quite like we can. It's a marvelous adaptation. It's up there with the opposable thumbs, standing upright, and language, as one of the things that got our species out of the trees and into the shopping mall. Uh, I don't want any shadow to fall on Dan, because he's a really good researcher, innovative and so on. Uh, I like his research, I'm inspired by it. But um, this is an example of how it often works in my field. People just say things <laughs> about humans. But first, so you can try this ability out. How many of you are hungry right now? Okay. You can lower your hands. Those of you who are not hungry, please shut your eyes for a couple of seconds and think about your lunch tomorrow. Okay, was it hard? No. This is the marvelous adaptation. It is, it is marvelous. It's very exciting. We can just build a world inside our heads. This, has, this is uniquely human. And Dan is in a very good and crowded company. Many people have said this since Aristotle till nowadays. It's uniquely human to think like this. Uh, but how do you know that something is uniquely human if you only check the humans? I mean, it doesn't make sense. It's just to show that it's a very special ability, then you say it's uniquely human. So I give you Santino. Uh, he's a dominant male chimpanzee in his 30s, and he obviously had not read uh, textbooks in psychology and philosophy explaining to him that he can't do what he does. Uh, but before going into what he actually does, uh, I would like you to give you the background. Uh, I think it was four, four or five years ago, I called this Furovig Zoo, that's here in Sweden, and asked, asked them about, could I do planning studies, experimental studies on your apes, orangutans and chimpanzees? And they said, sure, you're welcome. But then they said, but you don't have to because our apes plan already. And I said, yeah, sure. No, I didn't say that. I was polite. I thought, <laughs> no, yeah, sure, he, they do. Because I thought, like everyone else, it's uniquely human. So I actually went there just to check out the limitations of the apes. Uh, but then there was this dream that some scientist, that you can have as a, it's only a dream, often, for a scientist, to be utterly wrong. And I was utterly wrong. Because these apes, they passed every experiment I did. They weren't supposed to do that. So. Then I turned to the zookeeper and said, what did you say that this Santino did again? And they told me, and I started to observe him. What he does is, 
He does something that many chimps do in zoos all over the world, throw things at people, at visitors. And they do this because it's a typical, normal chimpanzee behavior if you're a dominant male. Each day or almost every day, you have to do a dominance display. Stand on two, two legs, run around, scream, make noisy things just to show you have force. And the other apes are supposed to move, go up in the trees and accept him. Yes, you are the boss. The problems with humans are that they are on the other side of the enclosure and they often just laugh and don't move. So then many apes have figured out if you throw feces or rocks or whatever, they will scream and run off. <laughs> uh, so that's nothing special with Santino. Uh, but what he did, as you can understand, this is a big problem for a zoo, having a chimp throwing stones at people. So uh, the zookeepers, they keep cleaning off this island every day, of course, it's dangerous. Uh, and to come up with a solution with the ammunition shortage, Santino just figured out that if I collect stones from the water moat that surrounds the island that you can see there, uh, early in the morning, when he's totally calm, he takes up these stones, put them in small heaps or individually, just at the side where the visitors will be. It's, it's about 25% <laughs> of the circumference of the island. Uh, and then, hours later, he becomes really agitated and does this dominance display. And then he has a lot of ammunition. So the important thing here is he's calm when he's planning, he's very agitated when he's using it. This is uniquely human. <laughs> and then, you can see on the picture down there, you see this frisbee-like thing. Uh, how many minutes do I have left? Okay, thank you. Um, this is actually made out of concrete, and it's made by Santino, because, uh, well, apes don't like water, for one thing. They don't like to put their hands into cold water, uh, or some apes. And he figured out if I can make tools to throw on people, then it, I would be better off. So he started to exploit the concrete structures in the middle of the island. This is up north, so it's a bit cold sometimes, so the concrete cracks. And he went around, he still does it, knocks until he found a hollow sound, and then he delivers a harder blow, and off comes this disc, or he can make it smaller. Uh, and then he takes it down to the heaps at the side. And this is actually one of the very few, or it's the only planned um, tool making for the future by a non-human. And it's also one of very few examples of making tools for not food related stuff. So this is what he does. And I show you very short footage. We, for ethical reasons, it's very hard to film him because if we see him do this, we should stop him. So as a scientist, you cannot just rig the camera and wait for the accident. So therefore, we have to rely on <laughs> visitors and their mobile phones. And here, it's a really short footage. Uh, it will be, it's taken by actually a professor in philosophy in, at Lund University, Don Egonson. When the Department of Philosophy are visiting and Santino is showing his displeasure with this, uh, and you will see the stone, also he will follow the stone. It's very short. So as you see, his aim uh, isn't too good, and that's good. Um, this summer we will try to get some better footage, and we have to figure out how to, to do it ethically. And I'm thinking of using water balloons, if I could get him into that. Because then I think people would find that fun. So, uh, what is really odd about this finding is that it became headline news in all over the world. I didn't anticipate that at all. I was totally surprised. I was uh, at vacation, wa walking in the Alps when the phone rang for the first time. And then it didn't stop ringing for 24, five hours actually, because the world is around. Uh, I think I gave seven or 10 interviews just to BBC. And this is the front page of The Guardian. Ape of things to come, the chimp who changed our view of humans. Uh, I couldn't really figure out what, why 
this happened. Uh, and I really felt guilty because my colleagues all over the world, they work really hard. <laughs> and this study wasn't too hard to make because actually it was the zookeepers that has been closely monitoring this ape in 10 years, making notes and so on because it's a problem in the zoo. So I just had to um, say, trust me, I'm a doctor and I wrote it down and handed it in. And <laughs> so, but if you think through it, or this is my theory. I don't know, I don't think that all journalists know this, but when one journalist uh, put it on front page, then the rest will follow. So perhaps one journalist understood this, and this is my last slide then, what uh, Santino actually did. Because what Santino did was touching a taboo. I really like this slide. Uh, and I must say, it's not my slide, actually, I've stolen it from a great, uh, it's red. Could we tone down the light a bit? I've stolen this slide, or the idea of this slide, from a great uh, psychologist and philosopher of mind, Nick Humphrey. And why it's ingenious, I will tell you now. Because what you see here is one of the greatest mysteries in science, or what you experience here. You experience red. To experience red is not trivial. It's a subjective experience. You cannot tell anyone else what it's like to experience red. This is the difference between being alive and being dead. This is why we are afraid of being dead, because we, don't, we will not have these subjective experiences. We will not taste chocolate. We will not feel anything at all. And for the last 300, 400, or 2,000 years, depending on how you're counting it, animals are not supposed to have subjective experiences. Today, many researchers would agree, yes, they have. But what Santino has is not only a subjective experience, but a detached one. That means when you close your eyes, you can see red. If you close your eyes now, you can see this red thing. And that's even more amazing. And that is what most people think of as thinking. Thinking is what you do in your head, what you experience in your head. So this is actually the big thing with throwing stones on humans. This is what it's about. And I guess I'll leave it here. Thank you.